Welcome to Healthcare IT Today. I'm John Lin, together with my colleague and friend, Colin Hung. The world of technology and healthcare are ever-changing in new and novel ways, and that's why we love this stuff. So join us as we discuss the latest healthcare and health IT news, meshed together in new ways which help generate ideas and new perspectives. Plus, we'll have a little fun along the way. On today's episode, we'll be talking about COVID and the return to work. Should we return to the office? Will remote work last? And much more. And be sure to follow the show on Twitter at the hashtag HITSM and our personal accounts at TechGuy and at Colin underscore Hung. Plus, check out our 14 years of health IT blog content at healthcareittoday.com. I mean, I guess we're already returned to work. But <laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, we never skipped a beat, I think, other than not being able to go to a conference. Uh, we've been pretty much working remotely as we normally have, right, John? That is a good point. Our, our, our work office used to be the airline and the uh, conference halls, and now it's home. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we we are a bit biased, so I mean, we should share that bias up front. You know, I've worked from home for ten years, so uh, you know, I guess I've had a different experience with remote work. And even summers, we'd move move somewhere uh, for the summer, and uh, yeah, so uh, you know, we are a bit biased in this. And I mean, you've been—is it two years working from home? Yeah, two years, uh, two and a half years, like, closing in on working from home. So. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, of course, anyone who was in the gig or who uh, was working for um, companies remotely, this hasn't been a big deal in terms of that transition. But uh, definitely, you know, we thought it would be a nice topic to cover because of some of the things that have been the new in the news, right, in terms of some of these larger organizations asking or wanting people to come back into the office after sending everyone away and enabling them to work at home. And now the challenge is related to bringing everyone back, right? Uh, yeah. And of course... Of course, what I'm talking about is is the big story about Epic, right? <laughs> that was been in the Rip news recently. The headlines topic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, what, what's your take on that whole thing? So, you know, you know, maybe give a little bit of background about what the story was, and then what's your take on that, John? Sure. And the irony is that the first time that Epic makes, uh, you know, really national mainstream media news was for a kind of a fiasco of sorts. Uh, as, and the, that is that they've essentially said, and Epic, uh, you know, Judy from Epic said that she thinks that it's more efficient and that her company culture is disappearing or something along those lines that it's, it's eroding uh, because they're not in the workplace and that she needs them and the company needs to return to the office in order to preserve that company culture. And she makes the argument uh, that they need to be in the office to be successful so that their healthcare customers can be more successful. So that was her position. And, you know, we heard that position months ago when she announced that the Epic UGM was going to be canceled. And at that time she said, we believe that the in-person is a valuable part of the experience. And so we are not going virtual because it's the in-person, the connection and all of that that's needed. So she's had this view for a while and now she's put it on her employees the crazy part of this story is she was really hardline about it and basically saying, all of you need to be back by this date. Now, she since kind of gone back on that and allowed some flexibility while I mean, she was kind of forced into it by CBS news coverage and also the health department, which sent them a letter and said, uh, remote work is not working in your office alone, <laughs> which is super ironic. Um, but the most disturbing part, I think, for me of this whole story is besides the inflexibility of like, I mean, come on, if someone's at high risk, why can't you have them work remote, especially if the majority of their job is remote? And we've heard that from a lot of employees. They're like 99% of what we did, we don't need to be in the office. So, you know, why are you so hard line when really, you, you know, many of the epic employees are working with remote clients anyway. <laughs> so like how is being in the office affecting that? But uh, it was crazy. They even put out a video that uh, you know, highlighted a lot of return to work uh, benefits and, you know, keeping distance, being respectful of employees, masks, et cetera. But then they had an immune compromised patient say, I've returned to work. I feel safe. And it's like, Whoa, you trotted out a patient who probably shouldn't be back at work to like preach your gospel of we need to return to work and it's safe. So anyway, it's it's just kind of a crazy story that she's so passionate about it. 
Yeah, I think that was what struck me the most about that story, John, was the inflexibility or the perceived inflexibility of yeah. that return to work edict, right? It was basically come back or else. Um, and we've made it, you know, and there was some stuff in there admittedly around, you know, making it safe and making sure that the protocols were there. So it wasn't right. like they were coming back and just being forced and crammed into okay. small spaces, right? Yeah. Like, but it, it was a little bit um, ironic that, you know, in a, in a, at a time when everyone's had to be very flexible in healthcare, particularly um, that, you know, the big, one of the biggest names in healthcare have come out and, and, and was perceived to be this inflexible. Um, then the other stuff was just sort of icing on the cake for me. Like you talked about that video, you talked about how they went about telling their employees and it was probably not handled the best way. Uh, and the video itself was a bit sort of, um, a bit cheesy. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it, it just, it just highlights well. And I, but I do feel for Judy in one sense that, you know, she has built that company on a very strong in-person culture being in Madison, right? They built that mega campus and, and, yes. and filled it with all of these amenities and things to designed to encourage people to work well at that office. And so when you all of a sudden have to switch to remote, I can, I feel for any CEO or in any uh, company founder where they feel that that culture is dissipating. And they're right, the culture is definitely changing now that you have remote workers, but maybe that's not a bad thing, right? And I think that was what, what most people are saying is that, hey, you're gonna have to get used to this because it's not going away anytime soon. And why, like you're saving so much cost and I'm so much happier working at home. Well, and the problem is the story gets even worse uh, in, in many regards, because there were a number of reports that team leaders that kind of revolted or talked against the idea were demoted is what the stories are. Epic denies that this happened, but uh, certainly it, it feels like there's been some retribution. And, and at the end of the day, this is Judy's MO. This is how she approaches it. When she has a passionate belief in something, she will go to all lengths to make it happen. I think we've seen that when it came to how do you implement Epic? Right. She has a passionate way in which she thinks it should happen. And when she believes that, she's going to put whatever teeth she can behind it to make it happen. The same was true with interoperability. She had a passionate belief that, you know, sharing this data would be a compromise to her relationship with her clients and the patients. And she's stuck behind that for good and for bad. <laughs> and right. so, like, she's applying that same approach to the return to work. And I, I think it's unfortunate because I think it's going to come back to bite them. Interesting, they even have one of their 13 epic principles. Like, one is don't go public. And there's a whole bunch of principles. One of them, and I can't remember the exact phraseology, but it's basically dissent. Like, it's okay to dissent and disagree and, and have a discussion. But then once a decision's made, basically fall in line. So that's the uh, approach that she's taken. Ironically, she wants to do it in this case, but when health is concerned and the health of your employees is concerned, that's a pretty dangerous policy and you know, principle for your company. Totally agree. I think uh, it's, it's not surprising that this is the way and, and the approach that she wants to take. It, as you said, it is consistent. So I give her that, right? And she's, it, she's, been, she's been consistent. I just unfortunately, it comes across very tone deaf. Um, it yeah. doesn't factor in a lot of people like immune compromised people. It doesn't factor in people who uh, just frankly are more productive being at home. Uh, you know, people have gotten used to this uh, and have, you know, anyway, there's just, uh, it just comes across as very tone deaf. Yeah. And if you have families at home or, you know, maybe you live with someone who's at risk or, you know, I think the other thing that's going to be interesting is if people, she's going to have to offer some flexibility the way this thing's blown up. And so I think she will. And I, you know, I, I'll give her credit for that. But then the question is, if you decide to stay home when you know she believes so strongly you need to be in the office, does that mean you're not going to get the promotion? Does that mean you're going to be discriminated against in the meeting and not be able to talk? Because you know, I've heard a lot of people, best practice, if you're going to have remote workers, then if one person is remote, everyone should be remote. Because if one person's remote and everyone else is in person, whoever's remote is kind of out of the meeting. So you know, anyway, it will be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Yeah, that's and that kind of a nice segue into the next uh, 
topic I wanted to bring up with you, John, that's really what's the future of remote work? You know, as, you know, of course, it, immediately it's, it, a lot of people are still remote and a lot of companies have not asked their employees to come back or it's voluntary whether or not you want to come back to the office. Uh, and, you know, until a vaccine is available, a lot of people are thinking that given the option, I'd probably like to remain remote. So what is the future of remote work? Because by the end of this, some of us may have had, you know, new people have had a year and a half now working remotely, uh, which is a brand new experience for them. So what's the future in your mind of, of remote work? Well, and I think that's what makes Epic's response so interesting, because if you compare it to the tech giants, they're all saying, yeah, through the end of the year, at least. I think Twitter said, will we ever go back to the office? Something along those lines. So yeah, they're realizing, hey, we can be as effective and as efficient. We don't need you in the office to control you. If you hire the right people who are passionate about their job, they can be just as efficient in a remote workplace. You know, that said, there is value to in-person. Uh, my favorite story is the WordPress one. They've been a distributed workforce forever. And he's like, it wasn't because we wanted to save on office space. He's like, in fact, I think it's about equivalent when their approach to remote work because what they would do and they can't do it now of course with COVID but they would bring you know once a couple times a year they would have a retreat in Las Vegas or wherever it might be and all the team would come together and they would remote work from Las Vegas for a week where they could connect they could have evening engagements they could you know create the relationship if they had a creative projects which I think that's where we miss out on the remote work is the creative side of things there's something really nice about a whiteboard and being able to talk over each other in a creative process that makes it that provides a different energy than video which almost has to be synchronous where I talk you talk you talk she saw you know <laughs> like so I think that's a challenge but the reality is we've seen kind of like uh, it, it, it you know, happens in healthcare all the time doctors thought that if we opened up and connected with patients and created a communication with channel with patients they were afraid oh they're just going to abuse it well we've proved that that's not the case and now doctors are okay with doing that well, the same thing is true with remote work. We thought, oh, if it's remote work, we're going to lose so much productivity. Oh, no. We tried it now. I mean, we were forced to try it. <laughs> and we, we've proven it's not a loss of productivity. And so I think it's going to hold more value and people are going to embrace it. And in many organizations, it's going to be a split one. Some people want to go to work because they don't want to be in that environment. And I think they're going to have that opportunity. But where people want to re remote work, I think they're going to be able to. Yeah, I think the, the, the future of remote work is that I think it's going to become a hiring issue. Um, I think some people are going to, uh, much like, you know, uh, demanding flexible hours or, uh, you know, benefits, I think it's going to become something that people are going to ask about in the hiring process. Um, and I think it's going to become something that companies either will tout or not tout, depending on which, where you fall, right? The flexibility or the ability to work remotely. Um, and and along with that, is there, Sorry, a group of, is there a group of employees that may actually want to be in the office? <laughs> I, don't I, know. I, I do think there are some, right? Especially in the, as you just said, in the creative areas, right? If, if you're a graphics artist, if you're working uh, at an agency, if you're working at a news uh, publication, there are, you know, a certain type of like a magazine or something like that. There might be reasons why there needs to be three or four people in a, in a room together getting creative on something. Uh, I could also see people who are in the sort of the event space, you know, event management and, you know, just need that high degree of coordination. So I think there are some jobs that, you know, obviously have to be in person or, or are more productive when you're in person, but a lot more, especially in the knowledge areas where it doesn't matter where you are. And I think that is going to become something in the future that people are just going to ask about. It becomes something that employee, potential employees are going to go, hey, do you have a remote work policy what's your remote work policy where do you stand on it because if you're if you're one of these people who are going to force me to come into the office that may affect my decision as to whether or not i come work for you interesting i think there is another group that it actually reminds me of all the people who when they heard i worked from home over the past decade they're always like how do you do that i've got to get to the office so there's this group of people that if they're at home they feel like it's hard to work. And I think it's probably people who don't like their job. Uh, you know, so like they, they, don't, they don't, you know, luckily I like my job. That's what I tell them. They're like, 
I don't mind working at home because I love what I do. And so like working is fun for me in many ways. So it's not too big of an issue. Whereas if you don't like your job, and yeah, going into the office was good because it motivated you to work a little harder. And I'll admit it, when you're sitting there working on the computer and the bed's right by you and you're tired, it's tempting to hop into the bed, right? Or when you see a little project that you need to work on, you're like, oh, I should have worked on this project at home. It can be a distracting distraction for many people. And so how you manage that made say, oh, I need a job that has an office as well because I can't work at home. But yeah, I saw someone on Twitter. They said, yeah, I thought how great. I, I should be working at home. Now I'm working at home, responding to emails at 10 p.m., answering phone calls at midnight. <laughs> like, he's like, never mind. I want to go back to the office. <laughs> it's so funny and probably so typical right now of, the, of working in the era of COVID, right? Sure. Um, hey, listen, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Healthcare IT Today with John Lin and Colin Hung. We're talking about remote work and back to work, return to work in this age of COVID uh, and all the implications that that entails. Um, so John, um, since, you know, we, of course, this is a IT related uh, podcast and, epi- and, uh, and radio show, we got to talk a little bit about technology. So what type of technologies have you seen or you've been impressed with that are going to assist with that return to work? Yeah, so I think the number one technology that's needed by organizations is actually going to be like the virtual desktop, the virtual remote work environment. So it could be a virtual desktop. It could be, you know, access to virtual workspaces that you can collaborate. And you might ask, why do we need that for a return to work? And my answer there is there's a great possibility that we're going to have to go back to remote work again. So, you know, every healthcare organization should be investing with the idea that, hey, I can use my virtual workplace either in the office when I return to work or at home or on the beach in San Diego if that's where it's needed. (laughs) And that's where we all hope we were working. But, uh, (laughs) you know, so I think that's going to be the number one technology that I see organizations need to do is how do I virtualize the engagement in my workplace so that I can work from wherever because I think there's still more crises to come, whether it's more COVID or whether it's something else, having that flexibility is going to be a feature that's needed by all, or all organizations. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a ton that I'm kind of looking at and fascinated by, you know, I'm, Right now, there's a lot of technologies that I'm looking at that are really designed to that front door, whether it's the digital front Mm. door, but actually the front door where, you know, there's some technologies that are coming into play that scan people as they're coming in and whether or not they determine whether or not they're wearing a mask, right? And if Mm. if you're not, it flags you, right? Or it flashes red. Um, So that way, you know, you know that people are having PPE. Uh, It also, there's some tools, one by uh, the Jonah Group here in Toronto that's built one that, you know, staggers people entering the office, right? So basically you have to book a time when you're actually coming through the door. So, you know, I'm at 8.05, the next person's at 8.10 that's coming through the door. So that way there's a staggered entry. Uh, There's also the ability to like, of course, like if you have a hoteling situation, you can, you have to book and then it will limit now how often, you know, how many can be booked up and whether you're in zone A or zone B. And then and then you can't go between them during the day. Like you have to stay in your zone and, and there's geofencing to, with your phone to disallow that or buzz you when you cross into the other zones, right? Interesting. Um, the, the, some, but there's some more subtle technology changes that I think are going to be required to re- assist with this return to work. One of the most obvious being booking meeting rooms, right? We used to book meeting rooms back to back to back. And, and now I think a lot of these softwares are having to do things where you, know, you, you have to leave 10, 15 minutes between meetings for either a cleaning crew to come in, if you have that, or, or a second, just to allow the air to clear, right? That, that's sort of the recommendation that, you know, you leave a longer period of time to, if you don't have proper ventilation or cleaning between, to, to let those rooms air out. So, so you can imagine now, like, trying to schedule these meetings that you're having in person, you're gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna schedule at like 1.15 to 2. It has to be a 45 minute meeting now instead of an hour because the next group got to, you know, I got to wait 15 more minutes. And so I think there's going to be a lot of those technology changes that have to come into play. Uh, and it'll be interesting for that return to work. 
Yeah, those are some good examples. And I think most people listening know I work with Care Cognitics. They have a whole return to work chatbot to understand how the patients, or how not the patient, but the employee. Interesting, they applied it to patients and employees, but the, are the employees, how are they doing? Are they at risk for COVID? But they also assess their mental health which I think is going to be an important measurement for employers as well. So the chatbot basically collects the information before the employee comes into work. Uh, now, I live in Nevada, which passed the very first state liability exemption for many organizations, but the liability exemption only applies if you're following the state mandates for face coverings and social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. And so Interesting. I think there's going to be a whole slew of technologies, and I think Care Cognetics can fall into this space as well, which is how do I prove that I made the effort to be compliant with the state regulations? Right. So having an audit log that I checked every employee to make sure they were doing it at the beginning, that's one big step towards saying, hey, we're being compliant with the state, and we shouldn't be liable if something breaks out. So I think that's an interesting one as well. The challenge is, Many of the technologies that we talk about, you know, whether it's seeing if they have a face covering, of course, measuring the temperature at the front of the casinos is happening here in Las Vegas. And, you know, we have a lot of those temperature screening ones or the thermal ones that are checking. I, you know, I feel like it's, it's somewhat like people talk about the TSA and when they say security theater. I think we're going to see safety theater as well, where it's like, yeah, it's not actually keeping us safe, but it gives you the impression that it is. So that will make you feel better and make you feel better to come to the office. So I think, you know, we'll have a lot of those things, but how much of it is about the impression that's given versus actual safety? Yeah, it's definitely a valid question. Certainly if you're only doing it at the front. Um, the good news is, you know, some of the companies that I've seen, you know, uh, one being Gradient the Sand, another one being AIH Technologies, they are applying these at stations throughout the building or throughout your office, right? So they'll be on the entrance to uh, a meeting room. They'll be on, you know, the hallway and they're passive technologies. It's kind of like that speed sign that says, you know, you're traveling at X you know, yeah. miles per hour. It's the same thing. So it can tell whether or not you're still wearing your mask and it will flash you and say, Hey, you're not wearing your mask. Please put it on. Uh, and so therefore you can sort of give that subtle reminder um, and not have to have a person standing there actually doing the screening for you. But you're right. I mean, it, it, there is a danger where it's just, um, you know, compliance wear, right? Where you're yeah. just doing it for the sake of complying. So, but yes, there's definitely going to be a lot of technologies. I'll just make another quick mention before we go to the next topic. But that, you know, to your point you mentioned before, John, like if you're going to have a split workforce where some are in the office and some are remote, um, the challenge is going to be meetings, right? Because right now everyone's remote. And so it's easy for everyone to jump on the web call, right? Yep. But but people who have been working remote with remote teams who are in the office know that the biggest problem is when you're in that meeting and you're like one of three remote people, you can't hear everything, you can't see everything, and then you can't contribute because like the three of you who are on the call can't talk over each other, right? Yep. And, and so that's going to be a real big challenge for companies to put in the infrastructure in those meeting rooms to enable people to be seen. And also, like, does everyone now have to just still get on a Zoom, even though you're sitting next to each other? Or yeah, that and then could you happen. need a bigger internet connection to support everyone Zooming from the office. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention all the feedback problems that you're going to have with all the microphones and speakers <laughs> being on, right? So yeah. it'll be interesting to see that. But let's, uh, let's get to the, the quick uh, way to capstone this uh, episode. What do you think the impact this is, uh, this is going to have on healthcare in general, this whole return to work, uh, workforce, remote workforce? What's the impact on healthcare? Yeah, I'm uh, really interested to see the flu results with so many people wearing face coverings, working remotely, et cetera, et cetera. Will we see the same flu spike that we saw previously or will we see a decrease? So there, could there be a public health benefit to this mess called COVID that it actually makes flu season much better? I, I don't know. I think it'll be interesting to see. From a health IT perspective, we're definitely seeing an impact uh, on the EHR adoption, implementation, optimization, where before they were like, you're a consultant, you better get on that plane, you better be in my office. And now they're trying to say, okay, Maybe I'm okay with some remote. That could work. And so I think we're going to see 
a lot of savings in that regard for a healthcare IT organization that doesn't have to pay the consultants to fly out there. They can just do it remotely and that will save them and the consultant a lot of money. Will the consultant uh, be sad because they're missing their A-list status and a few things like that? But uh, you know, that, that's a different topic. Uh, I think another one that's uh, interesting is most of the healthcare workforce can't go remote because they need to be in the office, sure. uh, but most of the health IT workforce can. So I think we're already starting to see those office spaces being re reworked. So where you needed office for your 100 uh, IT employees to implement your infrastructure, those can become exam rooms. And that, that's a really valuable thing if you can save that space. Yeah, I see the same thing happening. I think from, from a health IT perspective, the health IT department at a provider is now a candidate to go, why do we have them all together, right? Not only is that sort of a health risk now <laughs> in the world of, of viruses, but it's also, yeah, I could reuse that space for a lot of other um, things and other reasons, or a lot of times they were in a separate building anyway. Uh, yep. You know, maybe I can decommission that building or, or, you know, not have to lease that space. You know, the same applies to, uh, you know, people who work in marketing, people who work in finance, people who are not basically at the front line dealing with patients all of them now are candidates to go, you know what, it, it actually you know, it's okay to, to have these folks ro work remotely. Um, and, and as you've said, I think a lot of organizations have realized that there, you know, maybe initially was a drop in productivity, but they've quickly found ways to get that productivity back. And, uh, and I think that opens up a lot of doors because now you, you, I think one of the impacts I want to bring up is, I think what we're gonna see is a decentralization of talent. Right. Oh, Whereas before yeah. you're going, you had a huge concentration of talent, let's say in the Boston area, in of course Silicon Valley, uh, in certain in certain zones in Chicago. Now it's like, well, why don't I hire a project manager in Kansas City? Why don't I hire a, a you know a, an IT person in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Like I don't need to hire somebody physically this close, and therefore I might be able to save some cost because the the cost of me hiring for someone over in in a in a location that's a lot less has a lower cost of living might be less for me. And so you mentioned savings. I think over time, there'll be definitely some more savings as people now can widen their search for where people are located. Yep. I saw one tech prediction that 15% of the population in Silicon Valley, San Francisco is going to move out, which, you know, when you look at the prices, it makes sense why they're moving out, but man, that's going to be a change. <laughs> that, that definitely will be a change. And, uh, you know, I think, unfor well, fortunately and unfortunately, I think there's definitely going to be a, an equal number of people who want to go there, right? Um, Maybe. But, uh, but yes, I think it's definitely, it, this is one of those longer term impacts, right? It's going to take a few years to kind of see if this really takes hold. But definitely, I think in the entrepreneurial markets, in the small business markets, uh, in the knowledge areas, we're already seeing people going, you know what? An office space is no longer necessary. Like it's not something they'd have to plan for. You can totally be a virtual team and, yep. and do it. And we already see the migration to Vegas, to Reno from California, where it's expensive to live. They come to Reno or Las Vegas, no state tax. The houses are cheap. They can buy a, a full house for the size of a, a studio apartment in a bad area. So, you know, it, it's pretty compelling to leave. <laughs> it, it definitely will be an interesting, uh, an interesting thing to track over, over that period of time. Absolutely. And speaking of time, John, we've come to an end of another episode. So thanks to all of you who tuned into this episode of Healthcare IT Today. For more information please, and details about our show, check out the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And please share your voice and engage with the community at healthcareittoday.com and on Twitter using the hashtag HITSM. I'm Colin Hong with my friend and health IT collaborator, John Lin. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.